Okay, so welcome. So today the topic is going to be how to find a powerful test to distinguish between a couple of simple hypotheses. So um, let's kind of lay down the plot here. So suppose we have two um, simple hypotheses. So um, just as a reminder, a simple hypothesis um, is one where um, which completely uh, determines the probability distribution. So, um, so that is to say, maybe a hypothesis might involve some unknown parameters of our um, of our distribution function. Um, but for a, to be a simple hypothesis, it needs to completely determine, you know, what that what those parameters are. So, for example, we might have a, a coin flip, or a, so that is to say, um, a, um, a Bernoulli trial. That has a certain probability p of being, you know, true, and um, one minus p of being false, um, and so this p is our unknown parameter. We might have a hypothesis that says p is equal to a half. That's a simple hypothesis, or we might have one that says p is at least three quarters. Um, that's not a simple hypothesis because it involves a range of possible parameters. The main distinguishing feature of a simple versus a non-simple hypothesis is that um, if you have a simple hypothesis, you really have completely determined the probability function. So it makes sense to ask, what's the probability of a certain event happening given a hypothesis, given a hypothesis zero or one? Um, if it's not a simple hypothesis, then you don't have a single well-defined probability. Okay, so in any case, we have our two simple hypotheses for today. And we're going to design a test. So we want to describe um, designing a test to distinguish these. Um, to design a test, this involves um, dividing up um, the, um, the region of possible results of our sampling um, into, um, into regions of acceptance and rejection of the, these two hypotheses. So we want to divide up the, uh, the possible outcomes. So the possible outcomes you think of as particular measured values of our random variables, capital X1 through capital Xn, so the possible values of these lowercase guys. So this is, um, you know, something in, you know, some R to the N is some collection of possibilities. And we want to um, break up R to the N into two regions, which I will um, temporarily call R0 and R1 where if our answer, so this is shorthand for just x, if our answer lies in R0, then um, we believe that the answer is hypothesis 0, and we reject hypothesis 1. And conversely, if we're in R1, then we accept R1 and reject R0. Uh, sorry, H1 and reject H0. OK, so that's the, the basic idea. Um, by uh, convention, Um, we call um, R1 the um, critical region. So um, this is the region where we have to, um, where we produce the conclusion that something interesting has happened, that the null hypothesis, so if you recall the language from before, H0 is called the null hypothesis, which we think of as the default assumption. And um, R0, sorry, R1 is the region where we say, ah, the default assumption is not true. I'm going to take the alternative interesting hypothesis H1 instead. So R1 is called the critical region, and it's usually actually just denoted um, C for critical region. And um, the interesting parameters then are the probability that um, you accept this alternative hypothesis, even though the default hypothesis is true. This is kind of the error that we don't want to make in some sense, or that we want to make some assurance that we're not making. Um, this is alpha, and we generally, so we generally want it to be smaller than some fixed value. Um, on the other hand, um, the probability of, um, oh, and these are, these are called type one errors. Type one error means we rejected the null hypothesis when we um, when we shouldn't have, 
Um, on the other hand, um, we can say what's the probability that we are um, that we're in the critical region given, given hypothesis one is true. So in other words, this is when we conclude that we should have hypothesis one and we are correct. Um, uh, we want this to be as large as possible. So that, um, so that when hypothesis one is true, we are able to find it. Um, the ability of the test to do that is called its power and it's denoted one minus beta. This is the power of the test. So here, beta being the complement of that, that's the um, probability um, of not being in the critical region and um, uh, under the hypothesis one being true. Um, this is the probability of a so-called type two error. Where we where we are unable to um, to conclude H one even though it's true. All right. So um, of course, practically speaking, as we've uh, discussed, um, there are some limitations on how well one can do. Um, you know, you might have some alpha that you want to stay below. You want to ensure that you don't incorrectly assume. Um, hypothesis, uh, the null hypothesis is false when it's true. Um, but um, and and under those um, under that kind of a constraint, if we've decided how big we are going to allow alpha to be, um, there's only so well we can do in terms of power, right? Um, on the other hand, it's also um, important to realize that a few things that might be counterintuitive at first um, can also can also happen. So um, I should just point out that it's it's um, it is um, possible. And let me even say reasonable um, that for um, values um, which are not in the critical region. So let's say, I mean, let me just say that let's suppose that we're talking about a discrete um, random variable just for a moment so that I um, so that I can talk about probability of a given thing happening. It's possible that there are some values for which we say, ah, for this value, we are going to um, keep the null hypothesis. While at the same time, the probability of measuring that, given that the null hypothesis is true, is actually less than the probability of measuring that given that the null, that the alternative hypothesis is true. So in other words, there are, there are various situations, in fact, it's very common, where um, where we accept the uh, the null hypothesis, even though the result of a particular experiment might have been more likely under the null under the um, alternative hypothesis than for the null hypothesis. This is, a, as I'm saying, a very common thing. So let me just give uh, an example. Um, so uh, I think all the examples I'm going to have today are going to be coin flips. So we'll get used to that. But okay. So um, let's say hypothesis zero is the hypothesis that uh, maybe some coin is fair. And hypothesis one is going to be the hypothesis that the probability of heads, um, let's say, is 80%. Four out of five. And the experiment is going to be five flips. You flip the coin five times. And the critical region is, um, in other words, where, when do we say that we accept that it, we're looking at an 80% heads coin instead of a uh, instead of a fair coin? We'll make it um, five heads in a row only. So in other words, um, the only way I'm going to say that coin is unfair is if I flip all five heads. Otherwise, I'm going to assume um, that um, sorry, the only way I'm going to assume that coin is biased is one of the is this 80% coin. If I get all five heads, otherwise I'm going to assume it's fair, because of course saying that a coin is unfair is a very um, you know it's a it might be a very extreme statement to make you know. Um, so the probability you can see of a type one error. What's the probability that I get all five heads, but I have a fair coin? It's one out of um, two to the fifth, which is 32. Um, let's just say, okay, that's, you know, not so bad, let's just say. 
Um, but now consider, what if I get, um, what if I get four heads? Um, what's the probability of getting four heads under the uh, under the null hypothesis if it's a fair coin? Well, um, so under the null hypothesis, so this is a really I'm looking at a binomial random variable, so it's like uh, five choose one of the ones that's going to be the tail. Um, and then I have um, one half to the four, one half to the one, both heads and tails are probability one half. Um, so I get five over 32, okay, which is about, um, about 16%. On the other hand, the probability that I get four heads um, given the uh, alternative hypothesis, uh, five choose one, so four heads, probability of heads is 80%, so that's four fifths um, times four, and then one fifth uh, to the one. Um, so that's, uh, what is that? That's five over five to the five times um, four to the four. Um, so I get four to the four is two to the eight over five to the fourth is 625, two to the eight, is 128 128 over 625 um oh no it's not 128 that's two to the seventh sorry two to the eighth is 256 um and that is about a little over 40 percent okay so what do we find we find that under the alternative hypothesis there is a um you know it's much more likely to get four heads um, but but even so, if we get four heads, we're going to assume that the coin is fair just because if we didn't, um, then there would be a much bigger chance of incorrectly saying that the coin was fair, was, was biased when it actually wasn't, right? So right now, um, we have, a, where did I say, a type one error, the chance of um, improperly accusing the coin of not being fair is one over 32. Having that, having that be the case means that in this situation of, of uh, four heads, you know, it might be more likely that it's unfair in that case, but we're still going to say it's not because, you know, as I said, if we didn't um, else, the probability of a, you know, you know, if we allowed C to be uh, four or five heads, then the probability of a type one error, well, that's gonna be, so that's the probability of, uh, it's it's what I just said, the probability of X being one plus the probability of X being uh, four, um, probability of X being one or four given H naught, uh, sorry, um, four or five, I should have said five or four or whatever. So that's uh, what we just did, one over 32 plus um, five over 32, I'm just using this calculation that we did a moment ago. Um, so altogether six over, um, um, six over 32. And you know, that's, that's getting pretty big, right? Um, so that's like a 19 ish percent, I guess. Right. Okay. Which is pretty big for a type one error, right? It was, that's, uh, that's a lot, that's a lot worse than one thirty second. Okay. So we might be unwilling to, um, to, uh, to change our critical region and make it bigger and include those things just because we don't want our, uh, our type one error to get that much more likely on the same token, kind of, kind of on the opposite token. Um, it's also, um, totally, um, uh, feasible, um, to have, um, um, some element in the, some, some result which is in the critical region where I'm accepting the alternative hypothesis, but yet the null hypothesis being more likely. Um, and this is an artifact of deciding on an alpha to settle for and making your test as powerful as you can within that alpha, right? So um, let me give a similar coin flip uh, experiment 
uh, I won't uh, compute it all in detail, uh, but you, you can if you'd like. So um, here, H0 is going to be the hypothesis that the coin is fair. I'll have to make this a little more extreme. Hypothesis 1 is the uh, hypothesis that there is a 99.5% chance of heads. Um, and then the experiment is going to be, um, let's say, 10 flips. Um, and we accept H1 if 9 or 10 heads. So why 9 or 10? Why not just say 10? Well, of course, it's up to us to make the experiment as we want. But, but what's, some, what's an idea here? I mean, the point is that the probability of 9 or 10, you can just take a look under the null hypothesis, is let's say close to one percent if you if you if you look at it um and so maybe we're totally fine to um to um to settle for a one percent chance of a type one error so in, in that case you know we could you know if we said okay it has to be 10 heads we'd have of course a much lower chance of a type one error but if we're happy with one percent then we might be interested in maximizing the power of the test making it as powerful as possible by leaving alpha at um, at one percent and if we do that you know uh, why not get that get that extra little um, get that extra little bonus that we get from from including nine there right so uh, on the other hand you can just check that the um, that the um, that the probability that X equals so let's say we get X equals nine probability that it happens under the null hypothesis versus, versus the probability that it happens under the alternative hypothesis um, I got something like um, about again about 1% for this because really the probability of 10 heads is really tiny um, and the probability on the alternative hypothesis um, I didn't fully check it's less than a half a percent and so um, you know so in fact um, getting nine um, getting nine heads is um, going to be more likely under the null hypothesis than under the alternative hypothesis but we're still calling it the alternative hypothesis because we are satisfied with at least not making mistakes one percent of the time you know I, I mean only making type one mistakes one percent of the time and because of that satisfaction we don't want to miss the alternative hypothesis when it comes up and so therefore we're going to grab this as part as coming under the auspices of the alternative hypothesis okay so um all this is just by way of kind of um warming us up um to the idea which is um our our goal for today um how to find the most powerful test with a given alpha so of course alpha as I mentioned this is the probability um, of um, of accepting the um, the alternative hypothesis of, of uh, rejecting the null hypothesis even when the null hypothesis is true this is sometimes called the size of the critical region C um, it's also called the significance level of the test significance okay okay so um, let's uh, make a definition so um, let's fix a size alpha for our critical regions and we're only going to consider regions of size um, less than or equal to alpha so I don't, I don't want my probability of a type 1 error to ever be more than alpha 
um, and we say that um, that C is um, a uh, most powerful region. Um, for my hypotheses um, if um, for any other region um, I, I should say all these things are of a given of size less than or equal to alpha um, uh, D of size less than or equal to alpha, um, we have um, the probability of getting a, um, of successfully concluding um, that the alternative hypothesis is true by looking for it in the critical region C is at least as big as the probability of concluding it um, by using D as my as my region um, for um, for acceptance of the alternative hypothesis. So as we recall, this is this one minus beta, which is the power, and uh, which is you know how well you can find the alternative hypothesis when it's true, and um, and so we're going to say you're a most powerful region um, if you are. You know, at least as powerful as any other for that given uh, significance level or you know size of the critical region. Okay, so a um, a useful um, tool for figuring uh, figuring this out is called the uh, Neyman Pearson lemma. So. Um, let me uh, describe what that says. So I'm going to describe this in a couple of different ways. Um, on the one hand, we'll look at um, the case of a discrete random variable, which will let me kind of say it in, a, I, I hope, a slightly more intuitive way. And then we'll look at a uh, continuous random variable. OK, so let's just do the discrete case first. So um, what we're going to look at, um, so let's, uh, is we're going to look at this ratio, the probability of our, um, uh, the probability of our observables being uh, X, of our sample being some particular value X under the hypothesis H0, divided by the probability of it being X given H1. So um, what we want to, so the way we want to think about this is we want to, um, you know, we want to say that, um, so if you are in the region, so, so in the region where we accept um, the uh, null hypothesis, we want this to be big. And the region where we accept H1, we want it to be small, right? That's the basic idea. And so the Neyman Pearson Lemma says that, um, that if this ratio is at least as big for X in um, not in C as it is for all X uh, in C, then um, C is a most powerful region. This is a hypothetical comment meant to motivate a little bit. Okay. Now, I guess I should say, I mean, for this fraction to make sense, we want to, let's just assume that um, probability that X gives any given value given H1 is non-zero for all the X's that I'm considering so that I can at least make sense of that fraction for the moment. We'll kind of drop that a little bit later and kind of change the way we say it. So more formally, um, what I really want to say is that the, if I look at this ratio, probability of that x equals x given h0 divided by the probability x equals x given h1, 
this should be at least as big as probability that x equals y given h0 divided by the probability that x equals y given h1 for all x not in C and Y in C for every possible pair of that sort. So um, let me um, let me emphasize again that this is about simple hypotheses. And why simple? Because if we weren't talking about simple hypotheses, we would not be able to associate numbers to these probabilities. And you know, so that you know, we simple hypothesis means that we actually have a well-defined distribution with these hypotheses, and we can actually kind of give a bunch of numbers here. Okay, um, so let me just give a quick proof of this. Um, so proof. So, um, you know, of course, these things are all uh, positive. So these are, um, these are bounded below. And in particular, um, you know, there exists, let's say some number, call it K, such that, um, well, let me let me not say there exists. We can we can set um, k to be the infimum of the numbers of the form x equals x such that h zero divided by a probability that x equals x is this over the x um, which are not in C. So look at the smallest number that um, that happens in this way. Um, the above inequality um, tells us that um, that if I have anything, um, any point which is in the critical region, then this ratio of probabilities um, has to be less than or equal to, you know, um, it has it's less than or equal to all of the things of this form. And therefore, with x not in c, and therefore it's um, it's less than or equal to the infimum of such things, so that's um, less than or equal to k. Um, and of course, you know the probability that x equals x given h not by definition, x equals x given h one is um, is greater than or equal to k. Okay. So. Um, now, um, so, and, and that also tells me this other uh, useful way of writing this, which is that um, if I, so I'm gonna move the K kind of in the, in the denominator, I should say, by the way, um, you know, we're assuming that, um, we should assume that, um, let's see, that um, one of these, you know, let's let's just uh, yeah, we should assume that k is actually um, not zero, right? I mean, so maybe we're assuming that that there is some probability of getting x equals x given h naught, for example, or something like that. Uh, no, 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 that's not exactly what I wanted to say, but um, but yeah, let's um, let's assume um, that k is non-zero. Um, yeah, I mean, so right. What I, I guess I'm what I'm saying is we want to assume that um, that one of these probabilities is non-zero, right? So let's let's just keep. I should have um, maybe made that as an assumption, right? So I'll assume th that these are non-zero and um, that um, probability x um, um, so one of these things for y and c, so this is really the probability that x is in c given h naught should be non-zero. So that for something in that numerator, I get something non-zero. And that tells me that this uh, k should be non-zero. So k is non-zero. And so I can divide out and get that the probability that x equals x given h naught divided by k is at least the probability that x equals x given h1 for x um, not in the critical region. And similarly, the probability that x equals y given h naught over k is less than or equal to the probability that x equals uh, y given h1 for y in the critical region. Okay, so that's just a just shuffle those inequalities around, you know, just move this there, move that there, etc. Okay. So, um, 
okay, now let's let's actually do the argument. So suppose um, D is um, uh, I mm, 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 mm. Um, Mm, I guess, okay, yes, I realize I didn't quite state all this exactly as I should have, so I didn't put all of the hypotheses here. So what do we want to say? Um, we want to say that, um, so C here is a critical region of size alpha. Yeah, and then it's, it's going to be a most critical region, um, you know, with respect to alpha okay so so i want c to actually have size alpha as opposed to less than or equal to alpha so suppose d is a critical region um is some region of size um less than or equal to alpha um then um what do we find? Um, the probability, what I, what I want to know is that the probability that I'm in my critical region given H naught, so this is my alpha. Um, oh, sorry, what I, what, I, what I want, let me just say what I want first. That's what I know. Want that the, um, that the test with um, C is at least as powerful. So I want to know that the probability um, that I'm in the uh, critical region when I'm supposed to be is at least as big as the probability that I would have gotten for D um, given the hypothesis one. Okay, so what I what I know is that. Um, is that um, I have a critical region of size exactly alpha for C. So the probability that X is in C given the null hypothesis, this is alpha, and um, which is at least as big as the probability that X is in uh, D given H zero, because I'm supposing that D is a region um, whose size is no more than alpha. Okay. And this probability I can break up as X is in C and D um, plus the probability that X is in C and not in D, given H0. On the other hand, this thing on the right breaks up as the probability that I'm in D and in C, given H0, uh, plus the probability that I'm in D and not in C given H zero. Okay. Um, and you can see I have the same thing on both sides, so to speak. Um, so I can, uh, so I have this inequality that I can cancel off and I get the probability that X is in C, but not D given H naught is at least as big as the probability that I'm in D, but not C um, given H naught. Okay. Now, um, on the other hand, if we scroll up here, um, X being in C, well, for X inside of C under hypothesis zero, for X in C under, uh, here, for X in C under hypothesis zero, um, if I divide out by K, then this is less than or equal to that, the probability um, of that same probability given H1. So let's divide both sides by K. And then we conclude that, uh, so this thing on the left, sorry, the thing on the left, let me line up my, my, my things here. So this thing is stuff that's in C. So that's this guy, it's this one, and it's less than or equal to that thing right there. So I get this thing is less than or equal to the probability that X is in um, the same place 
given h1. And similarly, if I look at this guy right here, then I'm talking about values that are uh, not in C. So that's under this thing. And that means that this thing over K is bigger than the corresponding one with the H1, bigger than or equal to. Bigger than or equal to the probability that X is in that same place, given H1. Oh. Okay. So what do we, what do we see? Um, we have that this probability is greater than or equal to uh, this probability here. Okay, but now we are primed to get our conclusion. So um, let's take a look at the power of our of our test and see what we have. So the, in other words, we're going to look at the probability that we are in our critical region under the uh, alternative hypothesis, and that's equal to. I'll similarly break that up. C and D, given the alternative hypothesis, plus the probability of being in C and not in D, given the alternative hypothesis. And um, this term right here is this term right there. And so I get something that's bigger than or equal to the probability that X is in C or D, given the alternative hypothesis, plus the probability that X is in D um, and C complement, given the alternative hypothesis. And now we see that uh, these guys, I have a D and C complement, D and C, those guys add up and give me the probability that X is in D, given the alternative hypothesis. And boom, we're done. So that's, so, um, so this is bigger than or equal to that. And, um, and that shows that we're at least as powerful. All right. So um, now let me um, let me uh, conclude by giving a bit of a reformulation of this in the uh, continuous case. So um, And I'm going to do this uh, in a little bit of a, um, of, a, of a better way, I guess, in that I'm going to not um, kind of make these assumptions about all these divisions and stuff like that. But just um, so first off, you know, heuristically, so we see what, what kind of a statement we're aiming for. We're going to replace this um, probability that x equals x given h naught, for example, by um, the by some probability distribution that we have given hypothesis zero, so we can think of it as some f zero of x. This is a probability distribution function describing um, my um, my my sample given h zero. So just so that we are um, on the same page, you know, this is all about sampling. X is a shorthand for a tuple of n things. When, I, uh, when I'm saying this, what I really mean is I'm looking at some product of, um, of some distributions, I don't know, um, little tilde's for each of my xi's, i equals one to n, because these are independent variables. I have like some individual distribution for each of them, but I'm just sticking that all together in kind of like a x vector notation and thinking about that as f of x, where this, this x is really a vector of, of n little xi's. Okay, so that's really what's going on in the background here. Okay, so anyways, we're replacing, um, you know, a similar comment goes over here in these expressions. So we're replacing this expression by, um, you know, the, the value of a probability at some, um, at some value by the value of the, of the uh, density function. Um, and, um, and, you know, similarly, the probability x given x uh, x equals x given h1 by some density function, let's we'll call it f1, um, which is describing the distribution under hypothesis one. And um, and now we want to say something like um, the ratio. Of um, 
of the um, something like the probability. Usually, these are called the likelihood functions, but you know, the, in the, in this context. But in any case, the the value of the um, of the probability density function at some given point, the the kind of ratio of them um, is bigger for um, for points that are uh, not in the critical region than it is for points that are in the critical region. This is the kind of just analogous thing. So actually, I guess I want to say if this, then um, C is most powerful. But of course, we had all these like provisos about what was allowed to be zero and what couldn't be zero and all that. So this is maybe, you know, assuming f1 of x is non-zero and dot, dot, dot. Uh, instead, like, um, let's kind of think through now that we understand the proof, we can really say what our assumptions really should be, you know. So, so actual statement. Um, so um, if... If there exists some number L such that L F0 of X is at least as big as F1 of X um, for X not in C and L F0 of Y is less than or equal to F1 of Y for Y in C um, then C is most powerful. Oh, and I should say, you know, if, you know, so if C has um, power alpha, and if these things, then C is most powerful for for size for being sized less than or equal to alpha. Um, so the translation here um, would be, you know, as before, you know, we could go by letting, if we were um, using this ratio formulation, if we were kind of using this kind of an argument like we did before, we would start by letting k be the infimum of these uh, ratios f of x over f1 of x, um, given x not in the uh, critical region. Um, and then we wanted that to be non-zero, if you remember. And so um, really, um, we're letting this L be 1 over k in that case. But more generally, instead of making all those assumptions, if we assume that there is an L that makes these analogous inequalities work, then we get um, the proof will work just fine. So you can, um, so we can do the same um, proof as before. In fact, if you if we make this analogous assumption, but let me now um, let me now just step through the proof in this case. Um, so proof in the continuous case, which should be. Um, very much not a surprise um, from the, from the from the prior case. So how does it go? As as before, maybe we could start by saying um, the probability of a type one error being alpha um, is uh, is at least as big as the probability in this in this other region because we're assuming that D has size less than or equal to alpha. And, uh, and now we can interpret both of these sides as integrals. So this is the integral over x in the region C of f naught of x dx. Um, this is the integral for x. So really these are like iterated integrals within integrals over dx1, dx2, dx dot dot dot. I'm just putting those all kind of um, in this shorthand of just dx. But maybe you know to write this out really it's really integral 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 of um, you know for the x1 x2 for the uh, cumulative distribution function for the whole thing it's really f0 of x1 through xn which is itself a product of these various little guys for each x size and then this is dx1 dot 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 dxn but you know I'm going to be really lazy about this notation uh, and try to be a little more efficient about it so you know we could at least write it like um, like this, and um, and in fact I'm just going to use the really cheap shorthand of just saying integral over c of f zero 
an integral over d of f0, just so that I can save my, my hand a little bit of, um, of unnecessary effort. So really the, um, the statement is that the integral of over c of f0 being this alpha is, a, is um, bigger than or equal to the integral over d of f0. And that's the statement about, um, about the uh, assumptions about the size of d. Now, um, the integral over C is the integral over the stuff that's in C and D, plus the integral over the stuff that's in C and not in D. And you can see the same argument embedded in this. This is the integral over the stuff that's in D and C. Let me write it the other way, just for that's more poetic. Uh, integral over D and not in C. And uh, as before, we can quote unquote cancel these. I'm not cancel is not the right word since so it's an equality, I guess, but um, an inequality. But we get the integral of C intersect uh, D complement F naught is at least uh, is 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 at least as big as the integral um, of D naught and C F naught. Okay. Um, and now, what do we what do we know? Well. If I look at the integral um, of, uh, of F1 over C, um, so this is the, the power, um, this is the um, this 1 minus beta, right? So the power is the integral over C um, and D F1 plus the integral over C and not in D of F1. And the integral over C and not in D of F1, if we look back here, so I'm integrating over stuff which is in C. And for X's in C, what I know is that the density function for, for F1, for in C, the density function for F1 is at least as big as L times the density function for F0. And so I get this is integral C intersect D F1 Oh, uh, sorry. This is um, at least as big as this plus L times the integral C intersect D complement of F0. Um, and now uh, what I see up here is that that is at least as big as that. So this is bigger than or equal to L integral D intersect um C complement F naught. Of course, I have this um, other term here I don't want to forget. Um, plus integral C intersect D of, um, of F1. Okay. And now um, inside um, this place, uh, D intersect C. So this is the place. Uh, this is, so for points in C complement, this LF naught for things in the complement, the LF naught is bigger than or equal to F1. So this is bigger than or equal to um, integral F1 over D intersect C complement plus integral of F1 over C intersect D. And that's the integral over D of F1. And we're done, right? So as, as before, we've showed that this thing is bigger than or equal to that thing. And, um, and so we have a most powerful region. All right, so that's all for now. Um, maybe we'll add some examples in the next video. Um, let's see you next time.